Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Carbon Trust webinar on supply chain sustainability. Uh, so my name is James Parker, and I work in the business services team as an associate here at the Carbon Trust. So here is the agenda. So we'll begin with an introduction to supply chain and scope three emissions. Uh, we'll then look at, into the drivers for organizations to focus on resource efficiency and emissions reduction in the supply chain. We will then talk about some possible approaches to address supply chain resource efficiency. We will then recap on the key benefits of managing your supply chain. Uh, we'll also illustrate the points above with a few kind of case studies that we've been, we've been working on over the last couple of years and uh, done in a few different areas with a few different companies. Uh, and then finally, we'll go through the key aspects of the Green Business Fund. So if we start off we'll, with a few definitions about supply chain and scope three emissions, uh, I know many of you will be familiar with the terminology, but I'm aware that some, some people in the audience come from various different functions and might not have come across these definitions before. Therefore, it's always useful kind of to be on the same page and make sure we're all up to speed on these definitions. Right, so here is a diagram of the traditional value chain for an organization, which we'll be looking at mainly from the kind of point of view of carbon emissions. In the middle, we have the organizational boundary. So this includes the direct emissions from the direct burning of fuels in any manufacturing processes and also in the vehicle fleet. Uh, this also includes emissions from sources such as natural gas used for heating, fugitive emissions from heating and cooling units, and also indirect emissions from imported grid electricity. Uh, these emissions are classified according to the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is the most widely used greenhouse gas accounting standard as scopes one and two. Scope one being direct utilization of fuels and scope two as electricity and also imported steam, if that's applicable for your organization. Uh, the organization is responsible for the scope two emissions, even though they don't actually occur kind of physically at the company's premises. So if we now look at the emissions upstream and downstream of the company, we'll be talking about what is known as the scope three emissions of an organization. They are not the direct emissions, but the company does have influence over them. Upstream, which as you'll see is to the left of the diagram, we have all the processes involved in, in extraction or growing of the raw materials, and then the processing and transportation of those materials until they reach the boundary of the organization we are considering. Downstream, to the right of the diagram, we are looking at all the emissions arising from the distribution to customers and consumers, the emissions during the life of the product, as well as any emissions from end of life treatment of that product. When we talk about supply chain, we are referring to the upstream portion of the graph. So this is the left hand side. That is the extraction, processing and transportation of the materials until they reach the boundary of the organization. So here we have a diagram from the greenhouse gas protocol where we can see another representation of a company's emissions across its value chain. So scope one, two and three. And the scope three emissions, which we'll mainly be focusing on today, can be broken down into 15 categories as shown here, which range from purchased goods and services, waste generated in operations, upstream and downstream transportation and distribution, business travel, employee commuting, the processing and use of sold products and, and a few others on there as well. So to summarize, all organizations are responsible for indirect emissions that occur in their value chains. These emissions can either occur upstream or downstream of the organization. And the supply chain emissions are those that occur in the upstream operations from extraction or growing of raw materials up to delivery of products and services to the organizational boundary. So next up, I'd like to look at why companies are focusing on resource efficiency and emissions reductions in their supply chain. I will begin by reminding us all of some key global trends that will explain why so many companies are focusing on this area. So if we look at the context in which businesses operate today, we can see in this graph that globally, kind of over the 21st century, commodity prices have fluctuated by over 350%, um, which shows the kind of range of prices and the volatility in the market. Uh, currently, there is a bit of an economic slowdown, particularly in China. If we look ahead, we'll see that the picture can look a little bit worrying for kind of supply chain and commodity prices. So the prediction for the global middle class is to double by 2030, adding, over, adding potentially over 2.5 billion customers. This clear macro trend of a wealthier, more urbanized population will continue to put pressure on resources and therefore pressure on prices in the longer term. 
and you can see some of the implications, kind of 30 to 80 percent higher demand for commodities and potentially a 40 percent water demand gap. And it's also important to remember this in kind of climate change context. So with the additional pressures on the supply chain that come from potential climate change, kind of over two degrees of warming by 2100, 40% water demand gap by 2030, and an increase in demand for arable land, um, it's gonna put real, real pressure on the resource efficiency and prices as well. So energy prices have continued to rise kind of between, over the 21st century as well as electricity and gas prices. Uh, and this has been further increasing the pressure on the supply chain as well, as well as the kind of own operations of companies and organizations. And then if we bear in mind the growing global commitment to hold the increase, increase in temperature on average to below two degrees and hopefully now below 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial temperatures, it is expected that the global price of carbon will increase over the next few years, as this is one of the key mechanisms for the various countries to achieve their nationally determined contributions. So considering this context, it becomes clear that companies that want to remain competitive are incorporating resource efficiency into all aspects impacting supply chain resource use. So what opportunities might there be even today in the existing value chain for organizations? This graph shows the carbon emissions in the value chain for a range of sectors. The, the light blue lines are the emissions of the direct operations of a typical company within that sector, whereas the dark blue and yellow lines are the upstream and downstream emissions. As we can see that depending on the sector, there is a general, a significant, in general, there is a significant amount of carbon and therefore energy in the upstream operations, the raw materials, extraction, transportation and processes. If we look specifically at the manufacturing sector here, what this tells us is that in most kind of manufacturing sectors, embedded carbon emissions within procured products and services are in many occasions higher than the company's own energy and carbon footprint. This means that the supply chains of these sectors and companies can act as multipliers of energy and carbon and in general resource related risk. So if we make an analogy with an iceberg, the own operations being the tip of the iceberg, but hidden risk upstream, the upstream the supply chain can be much larger. Many companies have visibility of their immediate suppliers, which we refer to as tier one suppliers. But then beyond this tier one, there is often a long chain, chain of suppliers that is not visible to the organization. And this can obviously have a significant impact. So if we take uh, sort of 10% across over 10% of equivalent value of operating profits caused by a 10% rise in energy bills. And if we look at this 10% rise in energy bills, this can add for a, for a kind of relatively large corporate business procurement bill can add between 40 million and potentially over 400 million pounds annually to this bill. Uh, on the other hand, though, there are clear opportunities because cost savings could be achieved by working with suppliers to improve energy efficiency within their operations. Based on the Carbon Trust experience over the last kind of 15 years, 20 to 40 percent energy cost savings are often feasible across different sectors and these often have short paybacks on the required capital investment. Part of these savings could be passed on along the supply chain, minimizing costs and minimizing exposure to energy cost volatility. Now we've seen for an organization it makes business sense to understand the impacts and exposures coming from the supply chain and work towards optimization. But there are also two other key trends in sustainability that most of you have probably been hearing about that are driving further focus and action on supply chain sustainability. I think it is, I think it is important to be aware of them and understand how they might affect your businesses and, how, and also how your organization can be prepared to deal with them. So the first one we have is, uh, setting, is the setting up of the TCFD, which is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. This was set up by the G20's Financial Stability Board after they recognized the risk that climate change poses to the global economy. The TCFD is a framework to assess and communicate climate risks and opportunities, and it has the intention of developing more efficient and effective climate-related disclosures that allow for more informed investment and credit decisions. The, dis the disclosure is meant to form a part of the financial filings, and therefore it is being taken very seriously by organizations thinking of adopting this disclosure. 
What is important to bear in mind is these, those companies that decide to disclose according to the TCFD guidelines will be looking at their supply chain partners to understand the risk and opportunities within their supply chains. They will want to understand as much as possible about resource efficiency, energy sources, resilience, and possible disruptions to build a clear picture and be able to manage the risks. It will be therefore important for those suppliers to understand and be prepared, and be prepared to disclose their own risks and opportunities and their own strategies also to manage those risks. The other trend I wanted to discuss is the trend for organizations to set themselves science-based targets on climate change. These are targets for emissions reductions that are in line with the level of decarbonization required to keep global temperatures increase to well below two degrees. And more, more recently, this has been updated so that targets should be kept to below 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial temperatures. Currently, over 550 corporates have committed to do this through the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and this number continues to rise relatively fast. The companies that submit their targets to the SBTI for approval have to assess whether their scope three emissions are over 40% of their total value chain emissions. And if this is the case, and as we saw from the earlier graph, it is quite common, uh, they also have to set target ambitious targets for their scope three emissions reductions as well. Again, this means that these leading organizations will be looking at their supply chain partners to understand their emissions and also to identify and commit to reductions in the future. So in this next section, we are going to look, look at some possible approaches to address supply chain resource efficiency. So here at the Carbon Trust, we've developed this framework to classify the approaches that companies can adopt to address supply chain resource efficiency. The approaches range from the more conventional to the more innovative. So on the left-hand side of the diagram, we are looking at supply chain approaches. This is working directly with supply chain partners on improvements, optimization, or redesign of the supply chain. On the right-hand side, we look at the interventions based on an organization's products. On the top half of the diagram, we represent the more incremental approaches based on incremental performance improvements and efficiency gains. And on the bottom half, we are talking about more transformational interventions, generally looking at closing the loop to various degrees towards a more circular business model. So on the top left of the quadrant, then we are looking at supplier performance interventions. Uh, so one approach driven by the procurement function is focused on supplier performance, which has the objective of incentivizing and supporting suppliers to invest in efficiency within their own operations. A, system, a, a systematic approach should include at least three elements. So we've got standards of performance, performance improvement, and a consequence and reward. And I'll now kind of go into a little bit more detail about each of those three elements. So firstly, the good thing to do is to establish the standard of, standards of performance for suppliers requiring suppliers to demonstrate they measure and reduce their environmental impact. This can be done via a scorecard incorporated into existing procurement processes. Data can be used from existing platforms or programs such as the CDP, CDP supply chain program and other standards such as, such as the Carbon Trust standard for water, waste uh, and all carbon, water and waste. And this provides independent verification and certification that suppliers actually achieve those uh, performance improvements. An example of this is uh, Marks and Spencers, which is a bespoke supplier scorecard that rates suppliers as gold, silver, or bronze. So the second element of a systematic approach is engaging with suppliers in performance improvement. So actively collaborating with suppliers to help them address the 20 to 40% energy cost savings that we estimated are often achievable. We see increasing examples where organizations collaborate with suppliers to fund detailed energy efficiency audits or to help actually finance the implementation of upgrades with capital investment in such a way that the benefits are built into a commercial agreement between buyer and supplier to make the investment more attractive. Um, an example of this is the Tesco Buying Club. So Tesco's helped suppliers invest in energy efficient lighting solutions and collective purchasing power used to negotiate discounted rate, rate cards. So in the third, lastly, the third element is the consequence and reward scenario. So this can be used to ensure that suppliers feel sufficiently incentivized to take action. So for example, buyers can include this as a differentiator or tiebreaker between competing suppliers. So you've got price, quality, and service criteria equal, and you can have uh, environmental factors as a hard qualification requirement or as a separator. So alternatively, as shown in the top right quadrant, 
are the product focused approaches. And this, this comprises of designing out risks and costs from a company's products and services. And this can be done through two main ways. So firstly, we've got product design. So this is attempting to reduce the amount of materials used or substituting for alternative, more sustainable materials or even recycled materials. And the, and the second product focused approach is product portfolio choices. So this is where companies may consider removing certain products from their portfolio or product range and introducing alternative, more sustainable products. Um, the biggest benefits, though, will often come from addressing supply chain resource efficiency in an integrated manner with both a supplier performance and a product focus approach. So I will look at three different integrated strategies that sort of use a bit of these, this uh, kind of both sides of the coin. So we've got supply chain optimization, joint innovation, and circular supply chain models. And I'll briefly break down these three strategies. So on average, the cost to remanufacture re a product is generally is generally 40 to 65 percent less than making a new product. So that anything that can kind of close the loop and do that remanufacturing product is is a uh, is a winner for companies. So supply chain optimization. So this is a sustain sustainability focused approach to lean manufacturing and supply chain management. Looks at optimizing the entire value chain to reduce resource waste and carbon emissions. So an example of this, decisions on supply chain configuration, such as whether you're doing local or offshore and sourcing, so the geographical location of suppliers. And this needs to take into account transport energy costs, as well as resource and environmental related risks. Uh, secondly, we have joint innovation. So this is collaborating with suppliers to creatively address challenges and develop solutions. And this can generate kind of win-win outcomes for the supply chain and the organizations. Uh, the suppliers will often have the knowledge and solutions to enable step changes in performance. And this can focus on product innovations or different aspects of the supply chain, such as logistics and manufacturing. Uh, a good example of this is uh, GSK's supplier exchange platform. Uh, it's an online platform su for suppliers to share best practice on energy efficiency and reducing environmental impacts. And lastly, we have the circular supply chain models. So these models seek to preserve and maximize the value of products or materials at the end of life and then reintroduce them back into the value chain. This can, this can enable significant savings in cost, carbon and resources. So remanufacturing the taking, which is the taking of an end of life part or product and returning, returning it to a like new or better performance with warranty to match. Uh, it can be an option for companies that manufacture relatively high value items and you see more savings from that. And often sort of the market resale price is typically 30, 30 to 40 percent lower than that of a new product. Uh, and the environmental benefits are kind of equally as compelling. Uh, Remanufacturing typically uses 85 percent less energy than manufacturing. So you get those corresponding carbon emission savings. Uh, Remanufacturing business models need to incentivize the return of products or components at the end of life. And this is typically done by offering a deposit back. And after taking this into account, as well as remanufacturing and related overheads, a significant amount of value is retained. Retained upon resale, even at a lower price, it all contributes to a uh, all contributes to the profit margin. Um, we've worked with bespoke programs for their individual needs that reflect the specifics of organisation, sector, and size. So it's obviously it's not one size fits all scenario, but there are lots of different ways of implementing this framework to varying kind of size of organisation as well as sector. Um, but one thing is important to state is that we need to identify first which suppliers and sectors have the biggest impact or risk within the supply chain. Otherwise, you know, you could be working in the wrong areas or not the most efficient areas. Um, it's also good to look at suppliers' appetite for sustainability programs and how this can be influenced from the, uh, from the uh, organization. So if we think about supplier performance interventions and how to work with existing suppliers for improved performance, uh, prioritization is key. So this is a typical graph of how we can support a company in doing some quick analysis by converting their procurement spend into carbon impact and then help them prioritize their supply engagement programs, either by individual suppliers or by a specific sector. This allows companies to build a more strategic and effective program to target emissions and therefore energy and resources in their upstream supply chain. Some other possibilities are to evaluate the current supply chain management performance against supply chain best practice. 
which is actually a part of the Carbon Trust Assessment, uh, the Carbon Trust Standard for Supply Chain Assessment, for which I can, of course, share some more information later if anyone is interested. So if we think about the bottom half of the framework diagram that we were looking at earlier and the more disruptive and transformational interventions, we can see that the idea is to move away from this pattern of a traditional supply chain model. So moving away from a take, make, use, and then discard scenario. And this can be done mainly in kind of two different ways. So this is an example of a more efficient model looking into remanufacturing and also fully closing the loop so that no value is lost. So in the top diagram, you can see after the use phase of the product, it is then remanufactured and then can be sold to a second consumer. Whereas in the bottom diagram, the end phase of a product is actually used as the raw material to remake the product and therefore having a closed loop business model. So we here at the Carbon Trust have supported companies in every and all the steps through an end to end supply chain program, depending on where you currently are at. Uh, and this can either be analyzing the situation, kind of the initial stages, articulating a new business case or a new business model, developing strategies, or assessing best practice and implementation of the supply chain program. I think we found one of the key learnings and important recommendations to be able to implement a successful and co coherent supply chain strategy is to bear in mind that cross-functional co collaboration is essential. To explore the full extent of resource efficiency, opportunities and risks, it is fundamental to involve procurement and supply chain functions, sustainability, research and design and product development. And this is actually sometimes easier in smaller, more flexible companies than it is in larger corporations. So hopefully it's something that is achievable for many of the companies in the audience today when designing a supply chain improvement program. So as a recap, we'll, now, we'll, now, we'll see now what are the key benefits for organizations to manage and improve their supply chains from an emissions point of view. So reduce organizations' carbon emissions, Potential cost impacts and increased competitive advantage, reduced exposure to supply chain volatility, enhanced supply chain network, improved reputation with customers and other stakeholders. Uh, it can drive innovation, can also address customers' requirements for information and disclosure, and can support credentials as a responsible supplier. So we will now review a couple of case studies to understand uh, how companies are addressing some of their scope three emissions and have a look at some of the outcomes. So firstly, we have a case study focused on supplier performance improvement, which has the objective of incentivizing and supporting suppliers to invest in efficiency within their own operations. So we supported Marks and Spencers in the development of a bespoke supplier scorecard that rates suppliers as gold, silver or bronze. So these are now fully incorporated into the procurement processes for Marks and Spencers and the scorecards are used for incentivizing improvement as well as to set minimum acceptance standards of performance. Uh, second case study, we also supported GSK in their scope three footprinting model of their value chain. So this included all 15 of the scope three categories, so not just the supply chain, but the modeling showed that 50% of their value chain emissions is in the upstream supply chain. And this finding led them to set up a supply exchange platform to incentivize improvements and share best practice among suppliers. So really using that kind of collaborative approach uh, to kind of improve energy efficiency across all their suppliers. So third, we have uh, another example is Carlsberg, where the value chain footprint led them to set up a strategy to increase the amount of recycled material in their packaging, as well as looking into how to promote downstream use and recycling of their packaging. So the outcome of this project was improved recycling. It led to a 50% reduction in carbon emissions at their brewery, breweries, 100% renewable electricity, and lots of new innovations that are kind of still, still developing today and coming out. And finally, the last case study, our work with Mila helped them identify areas where product innovation could have a significant impact on the footprints of a product. So it's identified that a new approach to manufacturing window handles could be taken by implementing injection mold processing. This greatly reduces energy consumption and shipping weight. This resulted in a 60% reduction of the carbon footprint of the product with no impact to quality. And it showed that a well-executed value engineering project is often a well-executed carbon reduction project. And this can be quantified, measured, certified, and communicated. Uh, so Mila's reasons for doing this Kind of it supports Mila's credentials as a responsible supplier. 
uh, using the life cycle analysis, which is how we did the product footprinting. And this, uh, this acts as a new driver to deliver exciting product designs and innovation. Uh, it satisfi satisfies market requirement for products with reduced embodied carbon and delivers a distinct competitive advantage for, for Miele kind of, and its customers. Uh, it also helps sub substantiating product environmental performance claims. And lastly, it enables independent product endorsement through third party certification and labeling of products to international standards. So lastly, I'm going to briefly go going to talk about the Green Business Fund, which is a free service offered by the Carbon Trust to small and medium sized businesses to help them gain knowledge and become more energy efficient. So I believe this may be of interest to some of the people in the audience today. So the Green Business Fund is available to small and medium sized businesses, schools, sole traders and charities in England, Scotland and Wales. Businesses need to meet two of the three criteria outlined and not have more than 25% of their business owned by an entity which does not meet the SME criteria. Uh, the Green Business Fund offers energy efficiency training through two hour workshops hosted across the UK. The workshops outline energy efficient behaviour and equipment to help reduce a business energy, business's energy consumption. And the next available workshops are in Stoke, Yorkshire and Milton Keynes. Uh, if you're interested, you can find out more on the Carbon Trust website. So the Green Business Fund can provide opportunity assessments both remotely or on site. This will include tailored advice with the top three costed energy saving recommendations and the next steps to realise these savings. The Green Business Fund also provides implementation advice. So this is up to five days, days of support from a Carbon Trust consultant and is still aimed at uh, non-large so SME companies. The Green Business Fund also provides technical webinars where you can learn about more energy consuming equipment uh, and how to make savings and also better understand the opportunity, business case and capital support available to SMEs. We also provide up to date publications to provide SMEs with information on reducing their energy consumption and these are all available to download via the, via the Carbon Trust website. So the Green Business Fund has also developed various tools to help small businesses measure, manage and reduce their carbon emissions. And again, these tools are free on the Carbon Trust website. So there's lots more information on there available, um, which you can uh, browse at your leisure. Well, thanks very much for listening. Um, I hope you've got some questions through so, so that we have plenty of time for that and we can, we can discuss a bit more about supply chain. Thank you. So we'll just take um, a couple minutes to look over the questions and then we will answer some. Okay, everyone. Um, so we had a quite a few questions, so um, I'll just read some of them out. Um, so the first question for James is, um, can you confirm how the TCFD fits into the context of ESOS compliance? So that's a good question and uh, we have a lot of ESOS experts here that will um, be, answer, be able to answer this in a kind of more thorough way. Um, TCFD is, is kind of separate to ESOS. Uh, ESOS is obviously a requirement for companies with over 250 employees um, and TCFD is slightly different to that. Um, but TCFD would certainly be taken into account by an ESOS reviewer when they were when they were looking at the compliance of a company. Um, but as I said, we've got a lot of ESOS experts here who would be really happy to answer the questions in more detail um, if you if you want to kind of call or message the Carbon Trust. Okay. Um, how long can it take for an SME to get a full report on their supply chain efficiency? What about to put it in place? How can the Carbon Trust help? Um, so this is a really good question um, and it's uh, it's quite hard to answer though because it, it fully depends on the sector, it fully depends on how much detail you want to get into and to the supply chain uh, and the measuring of the carbon footprint. Um, so it, it can be a relatively quick analysis process. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we have ways of taking procurement spend and relatively quickly modeling it to see where your kind of hotspots are on the supply chain. And then that can go all the other way to kind of life cycle analysis of a product, which is a bit more detailed modeling and takes a bit more work. Um, 
I think an initial initial way of doing this is to look at uh, talk to the carbon trust. We'll look at the procurement spend and we'll kind of do some hotspot analysis and then we'll find out where the kind of major emission sources are throughout the supply chain. And then we can talk about whether we want to do any kind of life cycle analysis and and go, go from there, really. Uh, so in the first instance, it shouldn't take too long, but a, a full report on the kind of full supply chain is, is quite a, is quite a big project. And are, is there any list of qualified suppliers? Uh, yes. So we have accredited suppliers on the Carbon Trust website as part of the Green Green Business Fund. So if you go onto the website, you'll be able to find our suppliers there. Um, okay. Should we include more than Tier 1 suppliers in Scope 3? If we include Tier 2, that could lead to double counting as the Tier 1 suppliers should be including the Tier 2 and their Scope 3. Uh, so that's a good question. Obviously, when we're talking about Scope 3 emissions, double counting is something that comes up quite often and, and is an issue for, for lots of companies. Um, and, but I think this depends on the sort of the what you want from doing a Scope 3 emissions uh, carbon footprint. So I think ideally you'd have all Tier 1 suppliers and then, and then from there you would then go on to look at some of the Tier 2 and do the analysis that way. Um, so whether you're double counting, I don't think you, you wouldn't be, you potentially wouldn't report your tier two emissions and that's part of the supply chain. You might just do your tier one, but having a look at the tier two and potentially further down is important because you can see, you know, where you can make more, more efficient savings and, and more carbon savings as well at the same time. Okay. Um, we are a service company. How do we fit in? So service companies, we, you know, still have scope three emissions, still have your direct emissions as well. As we saw from the graph earlier, those scope scope three emissions will vary from sector to sector. So it depends what, what type of service company as well. Um, but again, in the first instance, you'd be doing, uh, you'd have your scope one or two footprint, and then you do some initial analysis. You do some initial analysis on your scope three emissions um, and go, go from there, see where the hotspots are. Is it downstream or is it upstream? Um, and then take your kind of sustainability strategy from there. Okay. Um, who should be the person involved or responsible for reporting the carbon usage within a company? Um, so this would depend on the size of the company and the type of the company. So a lot of uh, slightly larger companies will have a sustainability manager who, who will take care of most of these things. Uh, in a smaller company, it might you might have a kind of a separate role for that so you might not be able to have a sustainability manager but it might be someone in procurement or someone in kind of product design and it will be part of their role to be to be incorporating some of kind of the environmental and sustainability factors um, but obviously any kind of energy manager or sustainability manager is is ideal for companies to be uh, to be looking at um is, are there any template sustainability policies that I can use? Um, so I don't think we have a specific template kind of that is a one size fits all policy. Um, what I would suggest is going online, finding companies kind of similar size and similar sectors to yourself and starting to have a look at the kind of way they're doing their sustainability policy. Um, and then another option would be coming to us and we can find out more about your company, the size and what your, what your goals are in the sustainability sector. And then we can start kind of designing a policy that you can use and implementing that uh, carbon management strategy. Okay, and then um, someone just asked about the slides. So um, we'll send across the slides after the, the session. So they, they will be available. Okay, so um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. So um, thank you everyone for attending. And if you have any more questions, um, after the webinar, feel free to send them through. So thanks very much, James. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.